Great. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's going to be a very exciting night. I wish you were all here with us in person, sharing in this lovely red wine and delicious cookies, but we're glad you're out there in uh, digital land, if you will. Um, so before we begin, of course, I'm Mary Cosa, the Director of Education here at the Virtual County Arts Center. And uh, for those of you who have never joined us before, this book club has been going on since 2011. We have seen over 80 plus docents, uh, excuse me, not docents, but authors, all from the region. And we're delighted tonight to welcome Kelly, who will talk about a very important female Buffalonian, many of whom we know little about, but appreciate so much the legacy she has left us. So before we begin, I'm going to turn things over to Michaela Walls, who will explain a little bit about tonight's procedures. Okay, so everyone I, online, I hope you can see the shared screen of the presentation uh, that Kelly will be giving. If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask her so you don't need to use the chat feature. And I am recording this, so I will hopefully have this online tomorrow afternoon. And yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Michaela. We're going to turn things over to Jack Edson, a docent here at the Birchville County Arts Center, a former librarian and tonight's facilitator. So Jack, all yours. Oh, thanks, Mary. Welcome, everybody. And welcome, Kelly. I have a little bit of biographical information about Kelly that I'd like to share. Kelly Hayes Macaloni is Director of Campus Planning at the University of Buffalo. Her work involves overseeing implementation of the university's comprehensive master plan and the strategic plan for UB's three campus environments. Kelly has dedicated her career to educational architecture and educating the public. In 2011, Kelly and a colleague, Despina Stratigakos, close? Yes. Thanks, yes. Collaborated with Mattel Toys on the design and launch of a new Barbie doll. Barbie, I can be an architect, a girl architect, woman architect. She has spent the last 20 years researching the life and career of Louise Blanchard Bethune, the first professional woman architect. Kelly has written and presented widely on Louise and recently released her own biography right here, which probably everybody's read or will read soon. Kelly's been an active in many, many architectural associations and also serves on the steering committee for the Trailblazing Women of Western New York, an initiative of Erie County Commission on the Status of Women to place monuments to women in our public areas. And she also did a real interesting TED talk about the little black dress and about the architect Barbie doll. And my first question before I turn it over to Kelly is, is there a Louise Barbie doll in the works? Thank you so much, Jack. And thank you, Mary and Michaela and everyone for, uh, for uh, coming to tonight's event. And I appreciate your question. And funny, you should mention the Barbie, Bethune Barbie, because uh, lo and behold, yes, there there she is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There she is. Mattel does not know yet about her, but Mattel will very soon. <laughs> so I couldn't help myself. I had to have a, a Bethune Barbie. So she... Um, and she looks an awful lot like the one of the photos from um, from the book. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, and the bicycle. Right there, and we're in and the bicycle, of course. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> did, did you want to share part of the book, or would you like me to open up with a few questions to get the ball rolling? Um, maybe what I can do is just uh, talk a little bit about how I discovered Louise and, and how I came to write the book. And that's the, the first few slides I can I can talk about that. So um, I'm originally from Newfoundland, Canada. I've lived in the United States uh, since, uh, or I lived in Buffalo since 1998. Uh, before that, I ended the good New York. I'm an architect. Um, and if you could just go to the next slide. And so when, in 2004, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2002, I attended a, um, 
a conference here in Buffalo at the American Institute of Architects Conference. And uh, that year, uh, there was an unveiling of a plaque that many of you have probably seen in Forest Lawn Cemetery that is near uh, Louise Bethune's grave site and it honors her. And it was uh, placed by AIA New York State and the AIA College of Fellows, uh, of which Louise was the first woman member. Uh, just as an aside, I'm the first woman from Buffalo to be a fellow since her. So, oh, wow. yeah, that's, 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 it's, it's a great thing and also a very bad thing that it's taken that long for number two. But anyway, thank you. The woman to the far left, Adriana Barbash, was an architect who uh, had been researching Louise since uh, 1985. And shortly after uh, this event, uh, she contacted me and said she was retiring and she asked me if I was interested in taking her all of her research or 20 years worth of research on Bethune. I was uh, one of two women board members of the chapter, AIA chapter. And so I, you know, I said, absolutely. But when you receive that in that cache of information, you feel like you have to do something. So if you go to the next slide. So the first thing I did uh, was to nominate her to the uh, Western New York Women's Hall of Fame. Many of you probably know about it because it was begun here uh, in uh, at Buffalo State College. Um, and through that event, this was in 2006, I met the woman, in, I'm in the middle, and the woman in front there uh, holding the plaque is Zena Bethune, who was uh, Louise's great great granddaughter and sole heir. She is. She just. Stunning. She is beautiful. Was beautiful. She and I became very close. Um, she was an actor and a, and a dancer uh, in New York and a philanthropist. Uh, she studied under Balaji, and she was really an amazing person. Um, and again, we were close for a number of years afterwards, and, and I discovered her through um, Adriana's information. Um, and then to go to the next slide, you can see this here, she is uh, again, just a really beautiful, she would have played Louise in the movie. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, and then sadly, well, in 2011, I had a very bad um, uh, illness. And as it turned out in 2012, just after my illness, Zena was killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And so I was devastated, of course. Um, but from that, I became uh, very close with her uh, her husband, Sean. And Sean and 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 Sean uh, started after Zena's passing, started going through their you know their archives, their information. If you go to the next slide, um, and he found um, a whole cache of photos of with you. So that be, when I first start took the research, there was only one known photo of Louise. And this, if you know anything about Louise Bethune, this is probably the photo that you have seen because it's the one. And you sometimes you see it facing this way, sometimes facing the other way, but it's the same photo because <laughs> that's all we had up until 2011. I found another photo um, and go to the next slide. This photo here, this was through another descendant from Will Fook. So Will Fook. The Bethune and Bethune, they were husband and wife, two architects. And then the gentleman to the right is Will Fuchs, their, um, their partner. Uh, Fuchs's great granddaughter found this photo and um, we, we did an exhibit on her at the Buffalo History Museum using this photo. We unveiled it through the Western New York Heritage Press's photos. And this was a great photo because it was the first photo to see her, you know, face, her, her full face. Um, and that was exciting. But this, it, the, the cache of materials that Sean, Sean Feely found were extraordinary. There were close to 30 photos. There were essays, et cetera. And so he contacted me when he found them and he said, would the University of Buffalo be interested in taking this information, taking this um this material, and I said I think they would, and uh, they, and uh, as it turned out, they did. So, UB uh, Library Special Collections has created now an archive on Louise Bethune, and we just unveiled it uh, in March. And there's an exhibit that's going on uh, in support of the book and the archive that'll be up until January. Let me go to the next slide. So, um, I'll just now begin, and just uh, I, I'll, I've got a series of. Um, I've got a series of 
excerpts from my book. This is very casual. There's uh, just a few of us, so feel free to interrupt. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll just go and I'll just talk as we are. So this photo that you see now, of course, is um, Lafayette Square um, in circa 1890 or so. And uh, what you're looking at is the German insurance building that was designed by Richard Waite, who was Louise's, um, Louise's uh, mentor. It is June 1876 in Buffalo, New York. Richard Waite, the most prominent architect in the city, was very busy. The construction of the Pierce Palace Hotel was about to begin, and there were other significant projects on the boards in his office. Waite's exciting new projects promised to elevate his firm's reputation beyond the confines of Western New York. Summer is warm and pleasant in Buffalo a welcome respite from the long and snow-filled days of wintertime for the Queen City of the Great Lakes. During one of those warm and busy days, 19-year-old Louise Blanchard entered Wade's office in the German insurance building at the hotel, I'm sorry, at Lafayette Square, looking for employment. This was most unusual because there were no women architects practicing at the time in the United States or anywhere else for that matter. I just lost my place here. Um, architects were expected to do more than just draw plans for a building. They had to uh, oversee construction, negotiate rates, maintain budgets, to manage the entire process that goes into successfully completing a project. Women just didn't seem to have the required capabilities to be successful architects. For starters, they were thought to lack physical stamina to work on construction sites. Why even their clothing, which included tight skirts and long, uh, tight corsets and long skirts with bustles, precluded this kind of work. The idea of a woman performing the uh, duties of an architect was hardly thinkable. Blanchard told Waite that she had wanted to be an architect since childhood. She said her friends mocked her in grade school, but she persevered in her ambition to pursue her dream. She graduated from Buffalo High School in 1874 and continued in its two-year college preparatory program with the intention of attending Cornell University's newly opened architectural department. She took advanced courses, tutored other students, and traveled in preparation for her continued studies. She'd hoped Waite would hire her for the summer and her program began. And despite the common prejudice against women working in the profession, Waite did hire her in June of 1876, enabling Louise to fulfill her dream and become the first professional woman architect. So this book, um, uh, obviously L Louise was, what's so interesting about Louise Bethune is the fact that she, was so early. I mean, the profession had just really matriculated from a craft to a profession. And for her to become an architect that early is just really amazing. And there, really she was not, it wasn't until the 1920s where there, there were quite a few women. There were some women around her era, but it wasn't until the 20s where we started to see an influx of our influx. More than a handful of architect, women architects practicing. You could go to the next slide. And it was all because of this gentleman. So this is Richard Waite. So I, you know, I, I of course, I, my, my book is, is trying to provide the context in which uh, that Buffalo enabled her to be, to fulfill this dream. Why Buffalo? Why this time? Why this woman? So I, uh, well, I do talk about the, her buildings. My, I was from the beginning more interested in her as a person and trying to understand why, why her, why then, why this city. So to go to the next slide. So I spent a lot of time trying to give color to her as a person. And so this is the earliest photo we have of Louise and she's about six months old. But look at those eyes. Those are the eyes of somebody, you know, who's determined, who was her own person, or at least to me. So it's the same eyes of the woman 
we, you know, we'll see photos of it just before she passed away when she was 57, but certainly as a, as a practicing architect. Um, there's, so part of, uh, part of, I think, the reason why her and why then was um, the circumstances of, of her life. She was born in Waterloo, New York in 1856 uh, to educators. Her, and they moved around. Uh, she was the first born child. They, they moved around. Um, her parents were from the Syracuse, Manlius, New York, and they were they stopped in Waterloo, had Louise, and then they ended up in, in Franklin, you know, Forestville, New York, which is south of Buffalo by about an hour or so. Oh, okay, great. So they were there during the Civil War. Her father was um, drafted for the Civil during the Civil War. So and and then they had, we don't know if he served. But again, they were moving around and then they had two children. When Louise was about three years, no, about seven years old, they had twins, Edwin and Clara. Uh, sadly, Edwin died when he was less than a year old. And then they moved to Buffalo. And then Clara died when before she was five years old. So in the span of about uh, 11 years, Louise's family moved three times. Her father may have served in the Civil War. They were away from their family. And then she went from being an only child to uh, the eldest of three, and then back to being an only child. So while uh, infantile death was more common, certainly than now, I think part of her perseverance was, you know, the trauma that she, that, that the family was exposed to. And so she learned to be an independent person. She was homeschooled also, so she was sickly as a child. There was certainly an illness there. Um, as I said, her father, or her, both parents were educators. Her father taught, and then after she was born, her mother homeschooled her. And then when she was in 11 years old and she moved to Buffalo, then she attended Buffalo uh, High School. Jack, did you have a question? Oh, I was just noticing the postcard you had of Lafayette Square. Yes. And realizing that the Lafayette Hotel is... It is Kitty Corner. Uh, yeah, yes. right, right. That's yeah. ground zero. Lafayette, Lafayette Square is ground zero to Louise's life, as far as I'm concerned. Right, so it kind of began there, and yes. her major exactly. building yes. is 100 feet away. Yes, <laughs> yes, and they lived a block north when she was or a block south of there she, they lived on main street they rented an apartment and buffalo high school was right around the corner on court street so this was I mean, obviously buffalo was a much smaller city at the time but still it the lafayette square was an important sort of right area and, and one other thing is in looking at the lafayette hotel for example yep. you really have to put it in its context yep. of other buildings that were there and sure aren't there now correct uh, so anyway yep. uh, we wonder where people come up with an idea well yep. sometimes it's related uh, to other buildings that exist um then yeah uh, yeah no absolutely that uh, that building is the second empire um building and it was an iron clad building which was very common at that well it was it was growing it started in new york in the 1860s this iron uh clad buildings there are only a few left yes, iron, Cast uh, iron, like yeah. in uh, soho yes exactly yeah. just like that yep exactly and Wade was very famous for for, for that technology mm -hmm. and the glenny building which is here now in downtown the uh, buffalo or is is it also, next to the arcade, or am I getting it? I'm so. not, it's not too far from the arcade. Okay, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, if you say, so here are some more photos of Louise. Again, I colored these. Again, you can see this would have been right around the when, uh, right around the time when they were down in Forestville, uh, just right around the time of the Civil War. Uh, next slide, please. And here we are now. She's in, we're into the Buffalo years. Um, and um, you can, again, you can see there's a softness, but there's also determination about her, you know. So here she is studying to become an architect. She decides she wants to be an architect and she's studying. Next slide. And this would have been her right around the time that Wade hired her. So she would have been, you know, 19 years old. Okay, so this photo, I think, uh, what was the basis for this design? But I think this is her wedding photo. Oh, okay. Her happiest uh, time and wedding or wedding dresses were often red in the eighteen eighties. So that's why I think it's her. It is her uh, wedding photo. If you could go to the next slide. 
And I, this photo I really love because she looks truly happy. And the man standing behind her is, is Bob, Robert. Robert. Um, and they were um, soulmates in very, in many ways, they were more contemporary to us in terms of you know, true partners in every sense, as opposed to uh, more the Victorian idea of what a marriage was. So I'm, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about their personality. Robert and Louise were married on Saturday, December 10th, 1881 at the First Unitarian Church at Franklin and Eagle Streets. The weather on their wedding day was pleasant for Buffalo in early December with light snow in the early afternoon and an average temperature of 25 degrees. The papers were, uh, were filled with advertisements and general stories about Christmas preparations for the holiday season. Photos that were probably taken on their wedding show a softer, happier side of Louise than how she typically appeared. Wearing a colorful day dress with rows of buttons down the front, a soft white lace collar and relatively modest taffeta bustle for the day, Louise was practical as always at her wedding. The dress may have been burgundy or claret red because those were fashionable colors for wedding dresses in the early to mid 1880s. The one fashionable, I'm sorry, uh, the one flourish she allowed herself was an adornment of spray of uh, delicate flowers and a feather in her hair. The couple enjoyed a close and warm relationship and complemented each other in temperament and skills, although they were very different types of people. Physically, both were average in height, Louise at approximately five foot two and Robert at around five foot five. Louise had a full figure with curly blonde hair and blue eyes. Robert had dark brown hair and was thin as a young man, but became portly in his thirties and into middle and old age. Louise was also very athletic as an adult, which is noteworthy for a woman at the Gilded Age in general, but particularly considering her history of childhood illness. Her friends at the, in the Buffalo Women's Wheel and Athletic Club described Louise as an early riser and fearless bicyclist, often leading 25 mile biking expeditions. They used to ride to Lockport, and Niagara Falls. And big heavy bikes. I know, <laughs> East Aurora. She rode her bicycle around town to the office and construction sites where she would inspect the work uh, of the contractors. Robert, on the other hand, was photographed as a boy and a young man engaged in fishing and hiking. However, in, I'm sorry, however, later in life, he was much more sed sedentary, unlike his wife. Louise was self-confident, ambitious, and assertive, a natural leader. She relished being the first, the first woman architect, the first woman to own a bicycle in Buffalo, to name just two examples. She was also the type of person who became passionately involved in a project, club, or association, but after exhausting her interest, moved on to a new one with the same focus and passion. Louise discontinued her membership to the uh, American Institute of Architects in 1904, despite her active role with the firm until 1911. After 1904, she turned her attention to genealogy and was elected president of the Buffalo Genealogy Club in 1907, extensively documenting hers and Robert's family trees in the later years. Louise was also intellectually curious she compensated for her lack of formal architectural education by using her mentor's library to supplement her apprenticeship. As a result, she became an, an intellectual elitist who valued academic pursuits, but this also made her dismissive of those less well-educated. Robert, or Bob as he was called, was not a self-starter, but he was a closer. Following Louis, oh yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So you get a sense of their personalities. Again, they were very much um, uh, equals. You know, she was a modern woman who had, they had one son, Charles, in 1883. They owned their own practice together. Um, and, um, and, you know, on week, uh, she worked you know, alongside him. And then on weekends, she worked out, you know, fit in time for her exercise regime. So she was, you know, very much a modern, modern woman. 
I think I did not mention they met at Waite's office. So both of them were interns for Waite and that's where they met. So Richard Waite was a very important person in, in both of their lives, but in particular, Louise. So it's an office romance. It's an office <laughs> romance. Yes, exactly. Yep. So uh, uh, here's a, so Louise, um, uh, Louise opened her practice in 1881. Rob, she and Robert were married later that year. And then by 1882, they uh, were in practice together. So it, it, it became Bassoon and Bassoon Architects. I, Char think, I just think it's remarkable that, first of all, that Wright hired her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But secondly, that her husband was such a partner that he was didn't feel competitive. Not only that, it was her firm. She actually, so her parents funded, her mother sold property so that she could Start find the finance the firm. Oh, interesting. He was the sole finance, while well, they were a partnership in name, it, she was the financial owner of the firm. So she was lucky on two counts. Yes. One, yes. Two men in her life who supported her, right. her ambition. Three, I guess, if you count her father. But yes, so she, she had a very close. The, the people around her, you know, that really her parents, her husband, and her mentor, and that, then her son. One question, um, Kelly, is when you met Zena, yes. did she have any family anecdotes? Um, you know, just like soft stories that, you know, I mean, we have. Um, yeah hard information at the archives but what about i'm always wondering about the personality yeah you know what, what were they like really you know well it's funny you said so louis uh, zeta didn't but sean did and what sean said is that um he he's long felt that the that the, in the Bethune family and in, in the marriages there's always one partner who is the more by far the more dominant and then there's one that is the less dominant, mm -hmm. um, softer. And so he said, like in their marriage, Zena was the dominant one, meaning she was the, um, you know, the go-getter. Go -getter, and he was happy to support her in that. Um, and in, in her, in Zena's parents, it was, um, it was his, her father as well. The, the, and then in her, their grandparents, again, Charles, um, who's Louise and um, Robert's son, uh, the father of Charles was definitely, like his mother, the uh, dominant one. And the, and the grandmother, or Zena's grandmother, his wife, uh, was very, very warm and loving and, you know, so supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, he thought, and so did Zena, I guess. That you know, Louise was by far the dominant woman, and and Bob was the nurturer. Mm -hmm. So, so that that is the that so that's where I, and I built on that, and I was able to find good justification for that assertion based on the letters that I've read and just looking at their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, plus um, the people you've mentioned, one person has a large talent. Right. Like the dancer, actress. Yep. I mean, that's a huge talent. The doctor, yep. you know, huge talent. Yes. Architect. Yes. So, I mean, I'm not putting on the other yep. partner, but I mean, right. if you're, you know, you either can dance or you can't, <laughs> yep. you know, uh, you can either be a doctor or you can't, you know. Right, right. So yeah. um, I can see where that would, um, but usually family stories are the real telling. Right. Uh, these, they may be anecdotal or slightly mm -hmm altered but they usually um convey what the human person wants to have known about someone else yeah well the only thing that i also that i know or that zena told me whether it's true or not that uh she that um her grandparents didn't marry until after louise and robert died um and there was a reason for that and she didn't know if that if it was they didn't approve of the marriage or just that uh, I think it was Louise was ill for so long that he just he, he he was not able to have his own personal life really until his mother died. So they were very close. I mean, they lived he lived with them just like Louise lived with her parents. Louise and Robert lived with the doll the, the Charles the doctor. Yeah, Charles lived with his parents until they died. And then, uh, and Louise had lived with her parents after they were married and had a child. They all lived together with 
Louise's parents up until 1891. So was, this, was, this we, close connection to the, your parents is yeah. Was Louise's the, father a doctor also? No, he was he was a mathematics teacher. Okay, yeah, I'm getting my bad. Yeah, 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 up. yep, yeah. Right. yep. So yeah, so that, but and this is sadly. So Louisa and Charles, Louise and Bob had one child, Charles, mm -hmm. and he and his wife had one son, William, Billy. Billy, Bill actually died when he was a sculptor in New York, and he died actually in the 1940s. Xena was only a baby. Mm -hmm. And then and then they only had one child, Xena. And then Xena never had children. So there were, I don't think there was enough of um you know, um, enough family for a lot of these stories to get passed down. I get it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so and and Zena was only a little girl when her grandfather died, so yeah. it wouldn't have been that time. Well, one question I had is, um, if you could ask Louise a question, yes, um, what would it be? I mean, something that uh, there wasn't really uh, an answer to, but uh, if you could ask her. What would a question be that you would ask her if you were in this room, for example? I would like to know her relationship with some of the women, the wealthy women from Buffalo. Okay. Why did she not design the Buffalo, the 20th Century Club? Why did why did she not design all of the buildings that were being built as Buffalo Sim was also built by an architect. There were a lot of arc. There were there were women in um, Gilded Age. Buffalo had agency, as we know, uh, and when they had agency, they did not hire a woman architect. The Women's Industrial and Education Building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Richard Wade designed that. When you were writing that, I thought yes. the answer was going to be, oh, yeah, and then they hired her. But it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the way it was written, it was sort of leading up to that, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Her friends were members of the Buffalo Women's Wheel and Athletic Club, and that group is, I don't know if you know much about it, but it is so amazing. I mean, this was founded, Louise was a founder, um, and it was founded in 1888. They were the second club in the country, maybe the world, to be founded, a women's club. And uh, they were all, they were mostly professionals. There were doctors, there were pr school principals, school teachers, Louise, and it was meant to give respectability to bicycling because the bicycle had just come, well, the bicycle had been out, but it had the, it had the safety, what they called the safety, which was now the two the two wheeled the same size mm -hmm. wheel. Um, and um, this was the first bicycle that was safe enough for the common person to ride. And women wanted to ride it, but they were criticized um, because, you know, they were without a chaperone and how do you wear a dress and all of that. If and, the wind blows. You know, oh, I know, heaven forbid, <laughs> your ankle is up in <laughs> place. So it was considered very unseemly. So these women... They risk their hard-fought reputations to establish this club to make it more respectable. Yeah. That was the reason behind it. So yeah, if you're um, following that, there's the rise of the women's club movement yes. in America. And I'm from Hamburg, and the library I worked at was started in 1895 by the 20th Century Club. Yep. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 19th Century Club, and there were 19 members. Oh, but wow. um, I read their um, minute meetings and whatnot, and they were uh, part of the big club movement around the country. Right. And nowadays, nobody wants to join anything. I or know, yeah. I mean, you're really missing out by not being a member of a club. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yep. uh, and then being women's mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, the male-dominated clubs, which were uh, very numerous. Um, right. So anyway, um, the club movement was responsible for a lot of um, growth and development uh, in America. Yes, absolutely. And women's clubs in particular gave them agency again, you know, to, to um, you know, public speak and to have opinions of their own. So they were, and so they would have them in, um, you know, in the library was a yes. common place. Yep. And to network with yes. other women right. running, say, yes. the Buffalo Club, they would take the train out right. and give, you know, speech. Um, uh, we had all the, um, the annual 
calendars, which listed um, the subject of every month's meeting, which was very interesting. So right. uh, yep. you really learn a lot. For, but the club movement um, is very important. It is. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, uh, so Louise was a member of the women. The, she, be, she was uh, inducted or admitted to the Western, um, the Western Association of Architects, which was one of two associations, uh, architectural associations. And that was in 1885. And this is what she would have looked like around that time. First woman to be admitted, uh, Daniel Burnham, Louis Sullivan, who you may know, um, famous titans of uh, Gilded Age architecture were the treasurer and the president. Uh, so, and they basically shepherded her ad admission. Um, so they were very strong feminists, just in case you're wondering. So hooray for them. Yeah. Did you have to change a rule? Yeah, they did. Was it on a technicality, she couldn't get in. Right. Is that how it worked? Yeah, because it was only men were allowed to, then they changed. They, they ended up, they asked uh, the membership uh, if they were open to having a woman member and they said if the what ladies practice in architecture she, uh, she yeah. counted one of us and so then immediately after um, uh, Louis Sullivan led the change of the bylaws to be um, uh, to say person as opposed to man which was one of the first associations to do that amazing so that so shortly after that she became a member of the um, of the American Institute of Architects. Um, and again, that also, you know, validating her as, a, as an architect because at the time there was no licensure exam. Um, and she became a founding member. She founded the American Institute of Architects Buffalo Western New York chapter. So uh, I, I always say that uh, ours is the first chapter to have an, a founding woman. So uh, as a, a founding mother, I should say, as opposed to founding father. Mm -hmm. This is maybe my favorite photo, and this is her at her office. And while this may look um, like a, you know, a Gilded Age person, in, in my mind, this, this actually, uh, I could take a photo of myself at my desk and it wouldn't look a whole lot different from that. She you is- have one of Birchfield. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She's at her drafting yeah. table. Uh, you can see there's a T-square line across. She's writing notes. And then uh, behind her, there's a portfolio. You can see the portfolio directly behind her, against the, against the wall. There's a set of drawings flung in the corner, just like my office. And then behind her, she's got some wallpaper samples, you know, taped to the wall or tacked to the wall. Um, so even though, yeah, it's very much uh, of that era, it's also very contemporary. You know, she's got her watch. She's got her watch that uh, hanging <laughs> at her, yeah. at her smartphone. She's got it uh, hanging <laughs> on, so ever keeping eye on things and, you know, making notes or calculations. So as much as anything, she's no nonsense. She's no nonsense. <laughs> exactly. Picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I, I do want to say, uh, at the time, Robert Louise had to, to walk a very fine line um, because not everybody would accept, especially the, in the city, uh, as being in the city of Buffalo, the aldermen and the councilors, they weren't necessarily supportive of having a woman architect do their project. So they'd be very careful, coy, as to who the lead architect was. So, so <laughs> excuse me, they had to walk that fine line. Now it's Kind of the opposite. We all like to imagine that Louise was like the the, the the sole talent and did all the work, and and Bob kind of just took in the glory. I mean, it was a small firm, and everybody did everything. So I I, I always you know refer to the firm as their firm, and you know I want to give him credit because he he not only I mean um, he deferred a lot uh, in his life and his career. For her, so I, I always want to give him credit too for being, um, you know, a very good architect in his own right. Didn't he keep the firm going after she stopped? Right. Well, they, yeah, they, he and his partner Will Fuchs became the third partner. But yes, yeah, so that she she stepped down. She got ill. Um, she fell during the while superintending the addition to the uh, Hotel Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And uh, she hurt her back. And then the, she had a series of illnesses uh, in 1910, 1911. And by 1911, she had to 
she had to, to basically retire because she was bedridden. Yeah. And, and then she spent two years uh, you know, leading a very diminished life and then finally passed away in 1913. She's young. She was 57. Yeah, to standards. Yes. Um, and you, many people are, haven't even hit the height of their career. Right. Uh, if, yeah, look at Frank Lloyd Wright. For, um, you know, yeah, 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 among many wasn't others. Wasn't that much younger than her, to be honest. Right. Yeah. The, the one thing I was wondering is she had kind of a very placid life, and many architect biographies I've read, they're wild. Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Stanton White, Stanford, Stanford White. White. Stanford White. Oh, yeah. I mean, he only, oh, yeah. not only did he design uh, Madison Square Garden, but got shot there. <laughs> you know, and then uh, Louis Kahn with the oh, extra yeah. family down the street. And, and Louis seems so normal. <laughs> right. Well, I will say that that, that these, these architects are, I would say, exceptions. Like, you know, for every... Uh, Stanford White, there's a Daniel Burnham who was you know, happily married and um, you know did some great things. Uh, in general, you know, architects were stayed. Yeah, lives. yeah, exactly. You know, but uh, but you, you but but what you point out is true. This is something that I've been thinking a lot about is the fact that um, men in the in a profession like architecture or just men in general have a, uh, been allowed because they have so much agency to take on personas. <laughs> you can see them in their clothing. And so yeah, you've got the you've got Stanford White, the you know, the Playboy, and you've got Philip Dance, right, Philip you know, Johnson. He's right, Philip Philip yeah, Johnson. They could adopt these personas where if you look at women architects, up until maybe in the past, up until Zaha D, every woman architect, what she the her prime function her prime goal was to demonstrate competence. Mm -hmm. She could not, she did not have the ability to take on a persona. And Zaha Hadid, I don't know if you know her, she passed away sadly several years ago, but she's um, arguably the most important woman architect of all time, but she was able to, you know, take take on a persona or be her, you know, her own true self. And the Aspen Art Museum? Sorry? Is it the Aspen Art Museum? Yes. Yep. She. Yeah. Exactly. She also did the um, Minneapolis or the Art Museum in Cincinnati, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, she's just an amazing architect, British architect, Brit Iranian British architect, Iraqi British architect. Um, just amazing, amazing. Mm. But but you know, you go down Julia Morgan, um, um, Natalie Dubois, who worked for uh, Buffalo's. Gordon Bunchak, you know, all of these women were uh, Mary Mahoney, uh, who worked for Frank Red Wright. Um, you know, they all had to, they were competent, you know, they they were dressed, you know, of their time, no florals, no, you know, flourishes. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they could not do that. They couldn't step out of the boundaries of what, you know, a what a competent woman could be. And so this is why um you saw we heard my, read my or heard my TED talk, yep. I talked about the fact that there were so many women of a certain age, the baby boomers generation and, and the generation before who were so offended by architect Barbie because you had a, an architect in a dress and you know, they had fought so hard to demonstrate competence and you know would not wear a dress because you know and they were so offended by it. Um but uh, the younger generation and you know loved it, and little girls loved it. And it's, <laughs> since it's uh, you know it's uh, I think it's it's proven to be a successful project. So oh yeah, yeah, no, it's just a great idea. Um, um, bring it down to a younger age group, exactly. and something yeah. fun. Exactly. Why can't we have? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you need a Christmas gift, so get that. Exactly. You, know? <laughs> you never know. You really right. you never exactly. know. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So uh, if you go to, oh, th there they are. So Louise and Robert and their son, Charles. Um, yeah, Looks the really mother. happy there. Yes. Every, it's, I mean, um, being oh, mother. And... Well, every every photo with Bob, she's got a smile on her face. <laughs> Without Bob, not so much. But, so, I, so that's always an indication to me that, you know, they were happy together. Go to the next slide. This is a great shot. So uh, there lives Louise. 
um, you know, just outside of Buffalo and one of her bicycle trips. So this, I mean, no bloomers for her. She was, you know, she wore a corset, you know, three to four layers underneath that skirt, mm -hmm. probably 10 pounds worth of clothing on her person, mm -hmm. I would say. And a bike, she's got her bike with her little basket, just like mm -hmm. Louise here, little Louise has. Um, writing. One question is, um, how did you realize or come to know that Louise was a bicyclist? So, okay, so uh, I gave a talk early on, about 2008 or so, uh, when I received in the cache of information from Adriana, and it was my one of my first talks at the, first talks in public on Bethune, I was very nervous. And I gave it at the Buffalo History Museum. And Cynthia Van Ness, who is a, a wonderful <laughs> yeah, architecture historian, yeah. <laughs> gave me this article that she had found on Folsom, from Folsom, um, a website called Folsom, which is the, pre, the precursor to newspapers.com. Oh, Fulton. Fulton. Uh, Fulton, you, Fulton. I, yeah, I the name, but it's you, Fulton. Yeah, yeah. But it's the archive. Some guy, a yeah. guy yeah. did it. Like his right. own head project. Yeah. So she found it for me. And 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 in this article, it was from 1893, I think it was, or 1892. 1892. And it was about the Women's Will and Athletic Club. And it talked about uh, Louis, uh, Mrs. Bethune, the architect, mm -hmm. is a founding member and the first woman in Buffalo to own a, her own bicycle, which mm -hmm. she charged, she paid about $150, which is like wow. $500 a day. So, that, so when she gave me that article, I knew there was more to Louise. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, so and, and that was when I got really excited. Yeah, leave it to Cynthia to find yes, exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, and that I, I already had been thinking I'm less as an architect living in Buffalo. Uh, I maybe I should have been more interested in the buildings, but I wanted to know like who was this person and yeah, yeah. You know, how did how did this how did she why her why then why here right one question i had um was i i worked at the central library for about 10 years mm -hmm. you know next door to the lafayette hotel so you know i'm very familiar with it and um would you say there's a feminine quality to the design because when i first saw the, the building of the hotel lafayette. yes when i first saw it i did not know it was designed by I didn't know who the architect was, right. and I did not know it was a woman architect, but it always struck me as having a feminine quality to sure. it. I think that might be the style because it's you know, it is French Renaissance it's and white lacy yes, curve exactly. on right. the corner. Yeah, yeah. I I it's it, that style was very common at the time, um, especially for hotels in New York and in Chicago. So the reason why she chose the reason why they chose that, I think, was the context as you mentioned. There were a lot of um, Second Empire, French Renaissance buildings uh, um, lining uh, Lafayette Square at the time. Mm -hmm. But it was also architects chose styles based on uh, site, but also type, type of building. Mm -hmm. So ho the idea of a hotel, they wanted this to be a luxury hotel. So, you know, Second, uh, I'm sorry, French Renaissance. Uh, you know, demonstrated that luxury that they were looking to capture. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, you know, I think that the, I I agree with you to, when you look at the scroll work, especially when you compare it, say, to the art modern lobby that was uh, you know replaced. Uh, by yeah, right, right. Chinese, which is a much more masculine. I agree completely. Yeah. yeah. And in your book, you gave us some pictures of the original mm -hmm. um, lounges, I think they were. And wow, it was absolutely gorgeous inside. I know it was. And actually, I was down there. Uh, Rocco and company allowed me to you know, go down during construction. And so they showed me when they were restoring the ceiling in the lobby, mm -hmm. if you poke, if you poke up like one of the lights in the ceiling, they kept all of the, all of that work, in the columns is mm -hmm. still um, there. So nothing was destroyed, which is a good thing. Yeah. But yeah. So yeah. So it's it's a wonderful building. When I walk, when I go there, I do feel her presence. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And the other building I really like going to, where I feel it is. Um, uh, what was the the former uh, 
Yealy uh, grocery store, which is was uh, um, the Italian restaurant at Bryant and Ashland, was the former just past oh, uh, Aroma, right? Uh, Roma, right. Roma, yeah. Joseph in the shop was just asking me like an hour ago about that building. Yep. Was it designed by Bethune? Joe that runs the shop yes. uh, was asking. Right. The firm designed it, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, so I thought so. Yes. And Very they, good. And so uh, Will Fuchs was um, the, the partner uh, and protege and then partner. He, um, of course, he was from a, a very prominent German family. So the Yearly family, the groceries, they were also very prominent. And they lived, uh, 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 Fuchs and his family, uh, they lived at Ashland and um, just down the street, like a half a block on mm -hmm. Ashland. So uh, I think that that was where the connection was, was through the Fuchs family, not. Oh, yeah. Through, but still, the, the firm designed it. You know. In looking through your appendix of billings in the back, yes. it leaves so many unanswered questions. I mean, you know, so many things come to mind looking at a name and a location yep. and thinking that must be, right. you know, something or was it was what was happening to you when you were writing it? I mean, if we had all the time in the world, we could crack it down and yeah. maybe uh, but if, there are so many possibilities indicated by the um kind of spreadsheet of different buildings i know and i found so i i uh, martin bushadlo and adriana uh, were the ones who did most of the work mm -hmm. i i adopted a martin's um list of buildings but i found about 30 of my own uh to add to it 30 or 40 or so yeah and um uh, the, my one big regret is that I did not reach, like, there was about 30 buildings standing, most of them residential. And I did not, I would, I, maybe my next project would be to reach out and take do, a picture of them all. Oh, uh, I've taken photos, but I'd leave, I should have, I would like to reach out to the, um, yeah, the owners. Yeah. If you get, had access yeah. to the search, for example, right. I mean, you could infer a great right. deal yeah. who had it built. Uh, and sometimes sure. some info we have does, is not actually accurate. Right. I mean, sometimes you find there's uh, another side or another version of it. Um, my one interest is, um, of course, Hamburg, and um, she designed a, a woodlawn. Oh, yeah, hotel. I know. I was so excited and, when I found discovered that. Is that still standing? Because there are two buildings that might be it, is my oh. my guess. And, and I can't take it any farther than a guess. Okay. But um, Lake um, Avenue at Route 5, there's a uh, Mansard Roof building. They both got yellow um vinyl siding on them now right. but uh one definitely was a hotel and there is a photograph of i believe that building with a bicycle like race and yes there it. was there was a bicycle race um I, maybe we should talk afterwards yeah, yeah. because i don't know i didn't know that there were any of those buildings that were still um see i'm not sure if they yeah. are or are not but right. uh there's nothing that i see that negates the possibility right the rendering that i saw that they generated um with the buildings were right on the beach oh hmm. so whether yeah. that was built, I don't know. I yeah. don't the rendering. I don't think there's any foundations down near the beach oh, in Woodlawn. Not. I can show you the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love yeah. to see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kat. No. I was. Did you know the? Um, uh, if you guys watched, um, uh, oh, um, PBS and you know, uh, um, the. Oh, it doesn't matter. We can carry, we can talk later anyway, but I, I love Masterpiece Classic and, you know, those shows that Jane Austen did, you know, the, they were there at the beach and whatnot. That's what I always think when I think of Woodlawn, mm -hmm. just going around with their umbrellas and mm -hmm. parasols, I should say. Yeah, Carrie. Um, I loved hearing the stories and your passion. Tell me one more time, when you received this information, was it on a computer? Was it written on a piece of paper? Was there handwriting? Like, what was it you got I received, I received five binders, three ring binders that were, each of them was about four inches thick and they were filled with, I still have them. They were filled with photocopies or notes, uh, clippings, newspaper articles, uh, the, the photos that Louise had taken. And she, luckily, uh, not Louise, Adriana had taken 
And the photo of the, um, if you go to the next photo, mm -hmm. this photo, so this is a, a very famous illustration of, of uh, the Hotel Lafayette that the architects released. Mm -hmm. And sadly, the, the original has been lost, but Adriana made contact with the, the family member of the Fuchs family that had it. And uh, she hired Nina Fornheim or Nina Fornheim hired a photographer Louis, for Adriana and they photographed the original. And thank God they did because it's a very good, I have the mind. I have, I have a whole binder of slides that uh, Nina commissioned or had done. Because again, after, shortly after that, there was a family dispute and the original painting was lost. Mm -hmm. There's the so, public library. To yep. the left. Yeah, I know the old library. Yeah. And a museum. Yeah. Um, it was a variety of different buildings, yeah. uh, different uh, yep. uses. Yeah, I'll never be able to thank Adrienne. I mean, this has been, I mean, as a woman architect living in Buffalo and uh, you know, our lives, mine and Louise's have, eerily paralleled. I started this work when I was in my early 30s, and now I'm in my mid-50s, and our um, our lives have had airy parallels, you know, mm -hmm. not just being two women architects from living in Buffalo. But so it's been a it's been a lifelong passion of mine now, career long certainly to tell her story. And I'm not done yet. I just uh yeah. Uh, but this was a big, it was a, it was a joy to, to bring her to life. Mm -hmm. And I'll just finish up because mm -hmm. I know we're mm -hmm. just about finished. So this is, this is such a sad photo. This is the last photo of Louise. Um, and I think this was taken, um, when she was on her way to Chicago to do some research for the addition to the Hotel Lafayette. Um, she talks about having uh, being asked, told by the client to um, who, who was the manager of the Hotel Lafayette to come with him and uh, his partner and wife to Chicago to do some research, look at other hotels. And she goes and they tour a bunch of hotels and she gives advice to some of the hoteliers and whatnot. And as soon as she comes back, she collapses mm -hmm. and, you know, is bedridden for two weeks. And then uh, and then he, Yates comes back to town, wants to meet with her. So she drags herself, puts on a fur coat like you do, gets to the office and has her meeting. And then after that, she got a ride back home and again was two weeks bedridden. And so she just, she never, she worked so hard uh, throughout her entire life that um, by the end, she just ran out of gas. And um, so two after two years, she was very much diminished and depressed, and, uh, and then decided, then sadly died um, in December uh, 1913. However, three weeks before she died, there was this wonderful article that the Buffalo Courier, I think it was, uh, anyway, one of the Buffalo uh, papers did on business women in Buffalo, and they described they profiled about 20 women. But Louise was mentioned first as the most important and prestigious woman in business in Buffalo. So that must have been a very, very satisfying, you know, to uh, to have that written about her at the end of her life. And this is her um, one of the obits, one of the many obits. So, so Kelly, have you thought about? taking renting a bus and doing a trip around Buffalo and finding these. I'm saying this because we did a Birchfield site. Oh. We rented a bus and we went from Birchfield site to Birchfield site where we painted, oh. looked at the paintings, looked at the building, and ended up at the Lafayette Hotel. Oh, wonderful. Brunch. And so while I'm looking at these addresses, I'm thinking, wouldn't that be a fun thing for yeah. <laughs> that would be a great uh, idea. I know. Yeah, I, I have to say, like my um, my my full time job is more than a full time job. Yeah. So, uh, but I have to be but... right. I but I have had um, I've had a nice conversation with uh, Explore Buffalo. So who knows? Yeah, um, they it would, would definitely be a hit. Um, yeah, it would be great. Um, 
you have to find out which ones are still standing and right. Yep. Figure out a pathway and end it. Run to the Lafayette. Yeah, so. right. Or just, I was thinking, not just her buildings, but her life. So, like, you or, know, life. Or, or a combination of right. the two, you know. So, so everyone has to be on a bicycle. Everybody has to be on a bicycle. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, right. Do one of the pedal tours. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, did anyone have any questions or comments? I just want to say it's it seems noteworthy that not only, like Mary said before, that these men were so pro women, right? Yep, they were. But also the education factor. She was educated, her mother was educated. Um, all those other women in her group, you said they were all Highly professionals. Yes. How common was that? And how did that how did that come to be for her? Like her sounds like her lineage, they were all educated people. Right. So her um so the, after the Civil War, um, that's when um, uh, there were um, colleges started, universities and colleges started uh, accepting women. So there had been conversations right from the 1850s about how design, interior design, architecture could be a potentially good career for women. But it wasn't, again, until the 1880s that it, it obviously became viable. Um, her, on her mother's side, uh, the Williams family, they came from a long line of very prosperous uh, family members. So um, her, her, her mother's descendant uh, had been very um, prominent in uh, the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so, so I think that there was, you know, that expectation from there. Um, but, but, um, it was still uh, obviously, you know, highly uncommon. Now, and Buffalo, um, uh, you know, the fact that we had the University of Buffalo, and you know, it was such a prosperous city that the, you know, the uh, the need for educated, the opportunities for women to become educated, you know, were great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think it's the first woman uh, physician. In the United States was the 1850s, and her name was Elizabeth Blackwell, and uh, the first woman uh, to graduate from UB, which would have been a medical school, was um, Mary Moody, and I think she graduated in the 1860s or 70s. So I think Blackwell went to Paris. No, no, no Blackwell actually went to Geneva. High school. Oh, okay. Like, yep. Yeah. She also, she was in Paris because there's oh, the David McCullough book oh, yeah, about, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. first woman right. doctor. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, sure, yeah, we can right. both be right. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, probably so. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was, th this was certainly an era when, you know, I women were breaking barriers. Um, there was, and, and the Women's Education Industrial Union was actively promoting women, you know, and there, of course, after the Civil War, just in general, there was a need for women to work because there were fewer men to marry. So they either, you know, had so, had to find something to do either to earn an income or, you know, to be productive in society. So I think after the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution and the fact that universities opened up, there were avenues at all of the levels, at from the lowest level to middle class and upper middle class mm -hmm. for education. Interesting. Yeah. Did anyone in the Zoom group have a question or comment? So I don't see anything in the chat, but unmute yourself if you have a question for Kelly. Well, I have two questions for you. Yep. First of all, what drew you to architecture as a career? And the second one is, what do you do at UB? Uh, well, so I, like Louise, I wanted to be an architect as a child. My father uh, is, was, he's retired now, but he was a project manager. He was an engineer and project manager in an architecture firm. So I grew up around floor plans, drafting, boards, tables, all of that. So I guess I followed in my dad's footsteps. Um, and at UB, I, as I, you know, I direct the, um, the design process uh, for our buildings. Uh, with a team, of course, uh, we do some work, uh, design work, but really we work with consultants and oversee the design 
uh, of, of the buildings. And we also do the strategic planning for the university. So School of Medicine, for instance, that was my first project when I came to UB and uh, our office uh, under my direction did the, 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 the programming site analysis, basically put together the feasibility of the building before we hired. The, so we do all the upfront work so leadership can determine if, um, if they want to pursue the project and we make the case to the state for funding and uh, along with leadership, obviously. And, um, and then uh, we oversee the, with the construct, with, the, with SUNY, uh, the, we hire a consultant and then sort of act as the liaison between the users, with, with the client, I guess, mm -hmm. to the consultants. It's a fun job, it's always interesting. Mm -hmm. And especially now, uh, with the growth that we have. It's, it's a really, we're, it's a very satisfying job. And I, I feel very lucky, Louise, oh, uh, she, did, did, she did a whole array of projects, but education was her favorite, but she felt that she could not pursue educational architecture as a specialty because being the first woman, she had to be competent in all areas. Mm -hmm. So I feel very, Fortunate that I'm able to specialize because that would have been what she would have wanted to do. And weren't you a big part of the psych center turning it into a hotel? I was on the Richardson, um, the Richardson Restoration uh, Board. Yes, I was, um, and I was on the project team that worked with the consultants on the design. Yeah, that was a wonderful project. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. We really, and I enjoy the evening. I'm yeah, sure yeah. everyone else did as well. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thanks thank you, Jack, for doing such a great job. Oh, you're welcome. Jack, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.